thinking about our regulatory strategy to what I think is the most important thing that Loyal is doing, which is trying to prove that you can get a drug approved for lifespan extension, for aging, and that aging itself can be an indication and can be an area of interest just as you know, boring as uh, oncology and other areas today. And so really the thesis of Loyal is dogs first to unlock human aging. Uh, we are building a consumer focused dog aging company, hopefully a dog aging pharma company. We have a robust dog aging pipeline, but the broader goal and the broader thesis and why I started Loyal was that the conclusion I came to when I was working for Laura at the Longevity Fund is that you can't get a drug approved today for aging. Um, you can't, almost every company we're funded uh, while at Longevity Fund was not straight working on aging. They were working on aging via indications. And this is valuable work. We need to do this. this is how we push forward novel drugs, novel mechanisms of action. But I think the key part that's been missing is that regulatory path for a drug for lifespan extension for aging. Uh, so the key thesis of Loyal and the key reason I decided to leave Laura, leave Longevity Fund, and start this company is that the master plan really is to get the first ever drug approved for lifespan extension in dogs. And I'll talk a bit about some of the reasons why this is, uh, we believe, uniquely possible in dogs, while it's not obviously possible in people today. Um, and then while we're doing this, build these aging biology models, this regulatory strategy, uh, and also revenue, which is actually very, very important to everything we're doing, to then facilitate dogs as a wedge into human lifespan extension. Um, we haven't been talking publicly yet about the regulatory progress we've made. Um, we're also running a longevity pivotal study, um, which we'll be able to talk publicly about if and when we get FDA concurrence on it. Um, but at the, really our philosophy at a high level is build the path and then facilitate the field doing it. So I'm really excited to, if and when we get there with the FDA, to be able to talk about all of this publicly so we can all share in these learnings and all push forward novel drugs um, through, all, through the paths that we're forging. So again, Matt went through the high level thesis, so I won't go too much on this, but you know, why does this make sense? Like, Why would going dogs first potentially help human aging? And the first and most important point is that dogs age like us. They are you know, well considered one of the best models of human aging. Um, again, this is a high-level slide, but at the high level, right, we have this unique dog-human co-evolutionary relationship. We've shared an environment for tens of thousands of years, and we have some preliminary data that I don't have here today, um, but I'm happy to talk about verbally, which is we've actually been able to show a correlation between uh, the pollution levels that a dog lives in and their uh, epigenetic age, or specifically, actually, the dogs that we mispredicted <laughs> the age of at, in that they were older, or we, mis we predicted them older than they actually uh, were from uh, 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 validated age records, were dogs that were living within a radius of formaldehyde-releasing uh, plant in the East Bay. Um, again, super high level, you know, this is not some like rigorous scientific discovery yet, it's really more of a directional discovery. But it's interesting because who lives with those dogs? The human does, the pet parent does. So you can learn a lot about dogs and pets and humans from them. Um, they also develop the same age-related diseases we do at approximately the same time in their lifespan, the big exception being cardiac disease, uh, potentially because there isn't a doggy McDonald's yet, although that might be a billion dollar business too. Uh, and they develop them at the same time in their lifespan, which is really interesting. And then finally, most importantly, is that our largest medical market behind humans. Um, this is important for twofold. One, the revenue aspect, which I'll talk about. It's allowed us to raise money from venture capital. It's allowed me to tell a genuine story of if we're successful, Loyal being a billion dollar company, which I guess is great for me, but more importantly allowed us to raise ca uh, venture capital to fund all of this work that we're doing. But it's also important because it means we've been able to layer the biological data we're getting with the uh, EMR data, with the clinical data, with the qualitative data of how is a pet doing over the time of their lifespan. It also has meant that pet parents have been very excited to work with us in our studies. Um, again, the Dog Aging Project really uh, forged this idea. I, I, you, I'm sure you talked about the exact numbers, but tens of thousands of dogs in their study. We haven't done studies that large yet, but we've been able to recruit. We recruited a 2,000 dog study in less than 24 hours from pet parents, and then we're able to pull in their medical data, able to pull in their data that we collected. And this is uniquely possible in dogs because it's such a large medical market, and then there's also not you know, doggy HIPAA. Um, there's also structural and regulatory advantages, and I think this is actually the most interesting aspect of what Loyal is doing. 
So again, you guys all know this, but at a super high level, you know, there's a number of challenges for going straight for human aging. There's an extremely long feedback loop to see any aging benefit. Um, there's no regulatory path, uh, as far as I know. There's incentive challenges too, which is one of the other interesting things, especially in the US, where preventative care is um, not as insurance uh, incentivized as it might be in another single payer healthcare system. And of course, all the standard stats about it's extremely expensive, low probability of success, long time to build a drug. We all know these stats, right? The more interesting thing is that how are dogs different? Uh, so we've been able to show biological aging, uh, quantitative biological aging in a dog in about six months. Uh, so that means that you can run a six month study, see that dog naturally age over time. And by the way, laboratory dogs are not, um, you know, they're not Great Danes. So these are actually medium sized dogs that we're able to see this aging in. And then you're able to see, you know, lifespan extension in three to five years. So a six month study is a completely reasonable study to run. We've run multiple six month studies in dogs. We also do induced accelerated aging studies in dogs. But then even seeing lifespan extension is something that you can do suddenly in a company that, that's you know, biologically reasonable. Uh, there's also an accelerated regulatory path uh, uniquely through the veterinary FDA. And this was really the catalyst and the activator of Loyal. Um, so in September of 2019, uh, FDA CVM opened something called a conditional approval pathway, which means you have to show full safety, full manufacturing, but only reasonable expectation of efficacy. And so what Loyal has been building is a connection between health span extension, um, which we believe we have shown for both of our uh, lead drug programs, and we submitted that package actually a couple weeks ago, uh, and a link between that health span extension, which is relatively able to be quantified with the tools we have today, and lifespan extension. Again, we don't know if the FDA is going to go for it. We just submitted it. We'll know in about six months. Um, we'll talk about it publicly, regardless of what happens. But it's it suddenly has made possible, again, having a drug approved in a reasonable amount of time for something that's a long-term uh, endpoint like lifespan. Um, three, there's aligned market incentives. It's a cash pay market. And it's actually super important because a lot of what we've been trying to do in building this consumer brand around a pharma company that we hope people love around this idea of having more healthy years with your pet is building this consumer demand for what we're doing. And that's been a big aspect of how can we align incentives between us, between the veterinarian who wants a dog to be along longer because then it reduces the, that CAC to get that dog into the door of that veterinarian, uh, can pay out over a longer period of time. It aligns with the pet food companies who want the dog to live longer. It aligns with the drug companies because they want their dog to be on that anti-itch drug or whatever for much longer. You have all of these incentives of line. And of course, a pet parent is the most aligned incentive because as somebody who spent probably 20K on vet bills in the last two months, uh, I can tell you that I care about my dog's health today and I care about my dog's health in two years from now. Um, the biggest challenge with this cash pay market is that our COGS are really important, and that's really one of the biggest challenges vet med in general is that uh, at a high level, uh, you really can't go for any complex modalities uh, because you need to have COGS that are cash pay accessible. Um, and then finally, and most excitingly, it's only about three to four years to get a dog drug approved. Um, we're really close uh, to hopefully, if everything continues to work out, getting our first drug approved. About 10 to 15 million uh, worth of work, not including people costs. And uh, historically in pet med, there's a 90% approval rate. Uh, and this isn't because FDA CVM has a lower bar or anything like that. They have an incredibly high scientific bar. But fundamentally, you don't have this translational risk. You, get, you test a drug for whether it improves aging in a dog, in dogs, and then you do a pivotal study to show that it improves aging in dogs. Uh, of course, there's some risks there. Of course, a, you know, a laboratory beagle or mongrel dogs, which is the other big laboratory population, is not the exact same genetically as you know, a labradoodle in San Francisco. But it's a much, much closer leap than mice to people. Um, and that's something that's been really kind of exciting that like you can tell this deeply technical biotech story that obviously, again, we loyal might not work, our drugs might not work, I'm not guaranteeing any of that. But there's a higher reason to believe that if we see early data uh, of health span improvement, which we have, that that's going to translate into the companion dog. And that's a really exciting uh, story for multiple reasons. Well, and what I'm saying here is we're super excited about building dog eating drugs. We're excited about helping pet parents and helping companion dogs. Um, and equally, we're excited about this idea of if we do succeed in doing this, and I really hope we do, um, we might not. 
how can we help the broader aging field by kind of bringing some of these regulatory challenges and question marks and pathways in a way that makes it incrementally easier to begin having that conversation. Um, thank you.